Thanks for clicking on this video. In video number one, Making Brass, we covered phases one through three. In this second video, we're going to cover phases four and five, neck turning and annealing. Connect the Dots is about sharing proven accuracy and precision guidelines, learning competition in a way that hunters can use in the field. Hi, I'm Jason Stanley. Welcome to Connect the Dots. If you are interested in this scripted out outline of making brass, you can find it on my website. Simply download it as a Word document and make whatever changes you want to make. I turn the necks on my competition brass because I want to control the uniformity of the neck tension and neck clearance. Having uniform neck thickness is a major player in both those games. Before we start turning necks, we got to do a little bit of math. My chamber has a 330 neck. I want to end up with 2000s clearance, so I subtract 2000s clearance from that. Three, two, eight. Now from that, I need to subtract the widest part of the bullet. Remember, not all bullets have a pressure ring. So you gotta find the widest part of your bullet and you measure that using a micrometer. Calipers simply isn't accurate enough. Um, if you're not sure which bullet you're gonna use, you gotta measure all of them and then use the widest one. In this case, uh, on my new heavy varmint rifle, I'm not sure if I'm using the 112s or the 118s. So I measure both of them. The good thing for me is they both measure the same. I'm using Randy Robinette's bib bullets. And on his website, it says that his 30 caliber 112s and his 30 caliber 11810s have a pressure ring of 0 0.3086. When I measured them, it said 0 0.3087. So which number do I use? use your number. In this case, I'm using 0 .3087. That's not saying that Randy is wrong or that I'm right. It's saying that our measuring technique and our measuring equipment might be a little bit different. Maybe his thimble is set a little bit tighter than mine, so it might squeeze just a little bit more. We're measuring out to four decimal spots. It doesn't take very much to change that last spot. Since I am using my equipment during load development, I'll be using my number of 0 .3087. From my 328 number, I subtract my 0 .3087. And I get 0 .0193. I then divide that number by two because there are two sides to that case. And my thickness that I'm looking for is 0 .00965, 0 .0097, 0 .0096, somewhere in that range is what I'm shooting for. I can calculate and I can measure up to four decimal spots, but to actually get my turner to set up that number, that's way more difficult. I want 2000s clearance. I want the 0 .00965, the 0 .0097 number but I will accept anything from one and a half to two and a half thousandths clearance, meaning any number between 0 .0099 and 0 .0094. As long as all my brass is uniform at that number, I'm good to go. I really don't want to go up to three thousandths clearance. Um, it's not going to hurt anything in terms of accuracy or precision. It's just I don't want to work the brass that much. For me and my competition rifle, the 0 .0097 or 2000s clearance is the number I'm shooting for. If you want more in-depth information on neck clearance and neck tension, please click on the video. This is a great time in the video to bring up the point of making this process your own. As you're watching this, you might be thinking there are certain phases that you find unnecessary. So skip them. For example, on hunting rifles, I might skip phase two and I might skip phase four. As you watch the video, you might be thinking that there are times or things in here that you want to alter. So alter them. For example, on hunting rifles, I want a little more clearance. I want 3,000s neck clearance. So I will adjust that number when I work on that brass. Do you have to follow this process exactly? Absolutely not. There is nothing in any of my videos that says you have to do it this way. 
but there's also no use in reinventing the wheel either. Take what you like from what I do to create your own process. That's what CTD shooting is all about. A key to having consistent neck thickness is matching the Turner Pilot up with the ID of the case neck. I want as tight a fit as possible without that neck grabbing on that pilot. Usually that means one thousandths difference, but I don't measure that. I simply had uh, Roger at k and because I use a K&M Turner. He ground me different pilots, 305, 306, 307, 308, 39, and 310. And then I match up whichever pilot fits that lot of brass the best. This is another reason why I did phase two inside neck ringing. When expanding from six to 30, a donut is formed at the bottom of the neck. I use two turners when turning my 30BR brass. The first turner is set to just barely skin the neck, but take that donut off. On this first cut, I set the depth of the cut to stop right at the neck shoulder junction. Remember in the first video, when I said, if you turn your necks, you cannot skip this next phase. If you are a neck turner, you're gonna turn your necks, which is phase four, you cannot skip this next phase. The reason for that is that the depth of the cut is determined by the case neck length. When the mouth of the case hits this stop, the cutter can't cut any further. If your case necks are inconsistent, then so will be the depth of your cut. I got my lathe set up, I got my turner set up, uh, this is the case that I used, and notice that there's some green squiggly lines on there. This is the sacrificial lamb that I was talking about. When I was trimming my brass, I actually dropped a case, and of course it landed on the neck. So I colored it, I expanded it back out, but this is going to be the case that I use to uh, set up my turners, set up the lathe, make sure everything's working right. I will not use this in competition when I get done. Um, I'll probably use it to set up my annealer, but I will not use this case in competition, but that doesn't mean I throw it away. I can always use this as a sacrificial lamb somewhere along the line. All right, it's probably not the best viewing angle, um, but it's what I, it's the room that I got. So the first thing I do is I put the case in the shell holder, tighten that down. I'm gonna be using the same lube that I used when I was expanding my necks. <laughs> As you can see, it goes pretty fast. I'm not gonna clean these cases. I still have to do the second cut, so I'm gonna leave that lube in there. And all I'm doing is skimming the necks and taking the shoulder, taking that uh, donut off. I'll be back when I'm done. I got the first cut all done and it really didn't take me that long. Now it's on to the second cut. And this is where I wanna be as close as I can to my 0 .0097 measurement. Uh, I will use feeler gauges to get me started and then I'll back it out from that. And with my sacrificial lamb case, I'll work my way in until I get as close as I can to 0 .0097. I also wanna change the depth of the cut on the shoulder. On my second cut, on my finishing cut, I want to cut down the shoulder a little ways. I want to cut into that shoulder. Uh, these cutters are, they have the same angle as the shoulder that I'm shooting on that 30BR. So I can cut down on that shoulder. And then when I fire form, that neck shoulder junction just blends in perfectly. Well, that took longer than I thought. Um, I was actually really close. I had a 0 .0095 and I probably should have just stopped but I wanted that extra 0 .0097, 
and I went the wrong way. Instead of backing the turner out, I made it go deeper and uh, I ruined two more cases, you know, until I pulled my head out of my ass, I, I ruined two cases. Uh, so I'm down three now. I dropped one, messed up two, set up my turner, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with the way things are set up now. My last three all came out to be 0 0.0097. All right, here we are with the final turn. Uh, I'll show you a couple cases. Pretty much the same process as before, but this time when I get done with the case, I throw in the camp fuel. I do take my time on this. Uh, I'm not trying to break any speed records. And to keep, help keep that pilot cool, I will clean my mandrel every four or five cases or so. There's a lot of chatter right now on the internet about the important relationship between annealing and neck tension. I am a believer in annealing and all of its benefits, but that's assuming all the case necks are the same thickness. The quality of your turner, your technique, and how hot this pilot get all influence the thickness of that cut. I use a K&M neck turner with a consistent feed in and out. My turning lube is equal parts of STP oil treatment, AMS oil, and case lube. If this pilot gets too hot, it can expand, which will make your final product thinner. That's no bueno. To help keep this pilot cool, I will take my time, but I also clean it with camp fuel every four to five cases or so and make sure I use lube each time I, I use it. All of this is just to ensure uniform neck thickness, which controls neck tension and neck clearance. Step 14, the last step in phase four. I am washing the cases in hot soapy water, just like I did in the first video on step five, except for on this one, I'm gonna double wash them. So I'm taking them from hot soapy water and I'm putting them in another bucket of hot soapy water. I will make sure I do everything I can to get that lube off those case necks. I think phase four is the most time consuming and nerve wracking phase out of all the phases. And it's because you only get one chance to do it right, which is why Al Nias always says, you only get one chance to make good brass. All the work that we have done in the previous steps has put a lot of stress into this brass. I want to relieve that stress by annealing. That will allow the brass to move correctly when we fire, form, and resize. I use a Ken Light annealer, and yes, I am in the, in the market for an amp, but I just have to save some pennies. Until then, old Kenny and I will get the job done. I set this annealer up to have a deep, dark gold color, but still be shiny uh, when they come out. I used to use two different uh, temperatures of Templac, a 450 and an 850. The annealing would happen at 450, um, but I didn't want it to get to 850. So I'd paint one side of the neck with the 450 and then the other side with the 850. I wanted the 450 to melt, but not the 850. Um, through just experience and reading the directions, I learned that the deep gold color but still be shiny was the color that I was looking for.
In step 16, I want to measure the case length. At this step, I am not concerned with the uniformity of one case compared to another case. Because when I fire form in phase six, they're all gonna change lengths anyway. I wanna make sure that they are under the maximum value. My maximum value is 1.520 for this brass. And these are all measuring 1.5, 17, 18, somewhere in that range. If they were over, I'd have to trim, chamfer, and deburr. 1.517. Step 17, the last step in phase five. I give each case a color. And this color helps me identify that this brass stays with this barrel. I am running four different 30BR barrels right now, and I have to have a way of keeping it organized. I then do the same color on my barrel label, and I also do the same color on my cartridge box. That way I know this brass goes in this box, which stays with this barrel. I like to color the extractor groove. Uh, it seems to stay on the case longer and doesn't make a, a mess on my bolt face. So, but this brass, it's now ready for the next phase, which is fire forming. And that'll be the first part of video number three. Thanks for watching.